The Bishop's Apron, the novel by W. Somerset Maugham, dramatised for radio by Donald Tosh, starring George Baker as Canon Theodore Spratt, Peter Pratt as Lord Spratt, and Lydia Sherwood as their sister, Lady Sophia. It was at a time shortly after the turn of the century that a deeply concerned hush shrouded the sea of Barchester. The hush was more concerned, if less silent, in the Bishop's Palace. Come in. Any word, Mr. Dean? The doctor's with his lordship now. Will he live? The doctor's not taken me into his confidence. We can merely offer our prayers for either eventuality. Barchester won't be the same if he passes over. No. Come, come, Mrs. Cordell. Should Bishop Andover die, I feel sure the sea of Barchester will survive. They'll not find his like. That, alas, is too true. However... Oh, dear, we may get one of them new, modern gentlemen. Uh, should Dean Inchforth uh, or Canon Spratt or even the Reverend Mr. Runcible succeed to the appointment. I'm certain Barchester will manage to teach them its ways. After all, it coped with Bishop Proudy and his wife. Only just. And I'm positive that between the Archbishop of Canterbury and our Prime Minister, Lord Stonehenge, a conclusion will be reached in which our traditions will not be overlooked. Won't they, Mr. Dean? Won't they? Meanwhile, in London... Thomas, 2nd Earl of Beachcombe, was on his way to call upon his brother, Canon Theodore Spratt, in Kensington. Here you are, Governor. Oi! What? You wanted St. Gregory's? Uh, that, that's right, yes. The vicarage? Yes. Well, you're here. Uh, <laughs> so I am. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Oh. oh, thank you, sir. Morning, Bosomi. Good morning, my lord. Is my brother expecting me to luncheon? Yes, my lord. He's with Lady Sophia in the drawing room. And you insist on leading me upstairs like a new lamb? Yes. Lord Spratt. Thomas. Oh, Theo, I hope someone entertaining is coming to luncheon. I've had a deucedly dull morning. Well, I'm only your sister, Tommy, but don't I merit a greeting? Oh, sorry, Sophie. <laughs> I've been so bored today. I fell asleep in my cab on the way here. Well, uh, there's only the three of us. With Lionel and Winnie, of course. Mm, family party. Then which I venture to think there can be nothing more charming and nothing more entertaining. Cultivating the mysteries of Theo. Are you angry to be made a bishop? You take nothing seriously, Thomas. It is a failing of which I cannot but recommend you to correct yourself. So it, you know, as well as I do, the Bishop of Barchester is dangerously ill. I'm told he is dying. He's been in far from good health for a long time. I cannot help thinking that when the end comes, it will be a happy release. I met him once. I thought him a brilliant man. My dear Sophia, Andover had a certain reputation for learning. I never had a great opinion of it. You shared a college at Oxford. He was at least a generation earlier. I'm the last to say anything against a man who stands on the threshold of eternity. But if the truth must be told, he was a doddering old idiot. And a man of no family. So you expect to succeed him? I don't know who there is with any great claim upon the government, but I shouldn't be at all surprised if Lord Stonehenge... Offered Barchester to me. You'd look rather a tough in leggings, wouldn't you, Sophie? Oh, my dear Tommy, I haven't seen his legs for years. This is hardly a matter upon which you should exercise your humour. Take my advice, Theo, and don't accept a bishopric until you've made sure the gofflings are beyond reproach. I'll tell Lord Stonehenge that an 18 hole course is a sine qua non of my elevation to the episcopacy. Ah, Winnie, there you are. Yes, Father. Where's Lionel? He told you this morning, Father, that he might be a little late and would join us at luncheon. Well, since your son became your curate, Theodore, you really should listen to what he has to say. There are times when it could affect the domestic arrangements. 
And what have you been doing this morning, Winnie? I have been to see the model dwellings that Mr. Railing is so interested in. You're not taking to district visiting. I hope you won't catch anything. The condition of the poor is very bad, Uncle. I think one ought to do something. Ah. Who is Mr. Railing? One of the Worcestershire Railings? No, just a common or garden railing. <clears throat> a very clever young man, and I think he'll be very useful to me. Mm. I notice your actions are always governed by unselfish motives. Mr. Railing is a Christian socialist and writes for the radical papers. I think he has a future, and I feel it my duty to give him encouragement. Mm, you do? Nowadays, with socialism becoming a power in the land, when it is spreading into every stratum of society, it behoves us to rally to the church. Christianity is socialism. Theodore, only the family is here. I pride myself upon being abreast of the times. My father, the late Lord Chancellor, was one of the first to perceive the coming strength of the people. I am proud that my family has always identified itself with the future. Advance has been our watchword. Advance and progress. <laughs> Anyone would think we came over with the Congress. You looked out our name in Debrett. Frequently I find it excellent reading to fall back on when there's nothing interesting in the sporting papers. Thomas. It's no go, Theo. A man with the name Spratt weren't at Hastings. I wish you would express yourself in grammatical English. I detest slang and deplore the habit of omitting the terminal letter of certain words. Theodore, it is time for luncheon. Come on, Tommy. <laughs> oh, dear Sophie. Neither of us may be sprats exposed to public gaze, but between us, we try to keep the junior sprats remembering their perch. <laughs> Unworthy, Tommy. <laughs> we all are. Well, Arnold, you did you take the wedding at 2.30 yesterday? Y yes, Father. And you delivered those papers he asked for to the bishop this morning? Y yes. Oh, satisfactory. I'm surprised you find it worthwhile to marry quite poor people. Our duty, my dear Thomas. We have to do our duty. Can I pass the grave? Uh, by the way, Willie, I find I'm unable to attend Mr. Railing's meeting this afternoon. You'll be awfully disappointed. He was expecting you to make a speech. I promised Lady Vizard to take tea with her to meet the Princess Wartburg Hochstein. A clergyman's time is never really his own, and the Princess wishes particularly to meet me. People so often forget that even royal personages have spiritual difficulties. I shall write a note to Mr. Railing apologizing, wishing him luck, and uh, with your permission, Sophia, asking him to tea tomorrow. Is he presentable? He's a gentleman, Aunt Sophia, and he's quite be... He's remarkably clever. Well, then it's high time I met him. I'm afraid he won't be able to come to tea tomorrow because he has another speaking engagement. Oh, well, in that case, you must bring him when he's not so busy. Shall I come in your father's place and address the meeting with him? Hmm? What's it about? Teetotalism. Yeah. Most of the London clergy go in for it now. The bishop asked me today if I was an abstainer. The bishop is a man of no family, Lionel. Well, that appears to be true of most of the senior clergy. Personally, I make no secret of the fact that I do not approve of teetotalism. Temperance, yes. How can you be temperate? If you abstain entirely, corn and wine, the wheat, the barley, the vine are ubiquitous. The corn strengthens, the wine gladdens a man's heart. As at the marriage feast in Cana of Galilee. I wonder if I... I wish you wouldn't continually interrupt me, Thomas. He who has solemnly pledged himself to total abstinence has surrendered to society his liberty to choose. Now, what is it you wish to say? I merely wanted to ask Ponsonby for some more potatoes. I knew it was a flippant observation. The bishop said that total abstinence in the clergy served as an example. As such, it has been a dismal failure. For many years, I have searched for one person who, being a drunkard, was so impressed by the example of his abstaining clergyman that he broke away from his vicious indulgence and became a sober man. Hawk, sir. Certainly, Ponsonby, certainly. What do you think of this hawk, Thomas? Mm -hmm. Not bad, I flatter myself. Oh, quam bonum est. Oh, quam jucundamest, oculus fraternus, uh, Excuse me, Canon Spratter. Yes, with us? Uh, Lord Roxham is in the club, and he's been asking for you, sir. Lord Roxham? Mm -hmm. ah, then I must seek him out. He was seen to go into the smoking room, sir. Thank you, with us. Ah, Roxham, my dear boy. Canon Spratt. Delighted to see you. Thank you. Uh, let us sit down in the window. Come. Tell me why it is you wish to see me. Thank you. Have a cigarette. Not just at the moment, thank you. Uh, forgive me if I do. We will match. Yes. 
Uh, thank you. Now, I, um, I ask to see you. Yes, indeed. I've known you so long, dear boy. If there's anything I can do for you, command me. The fact is, I mean, well... Yes? Well, with your permission, of course, I... I want to ask Winnie to marry me. My dear Harry, I will not conceal from you that your sentiments have not altogether been hidden from me. And you will understand that if I have not approved, I would scarcely have allowed you to come so frequently to my house. Oh, um, yes. I mean, yes. For many years, I've had the greatest affection for you. And since you took your seat in the House of Lords, I have also esteem and admiration. Thank you. But in these matters, one is a father first and last. I have reason to believe that you are a steady young man, without vices, and with an excellent temper, than which nothing is more necessary in married life. And uh, as to your circumstances? My income is 20,000 a year. Yeah. There are the three houses, as you know, and in mm. all some 7,000 acres. Uh -huh. Though it is true that some 2,000 of those are in Scotland. <laughs> Harry, my boy. I should like to leave all the affairs about settlements in your hands, Canon. I'll do whatever you think fit. Oh, all this is very satisfactory. I'm not a man to go into pecuniary details, thank goodness. I can honestly say I'm not mercenary. And I think we can leave business details to our respective lawyers. Thank you. My dear boy, I give you my full permission to pay your addresses to Winnie. Oh, thank you. Um, do you think she... She cares for me. You need have no fear, Harry, on that point. Of course, I leave my children complete liberty of action. But I don't think I am indiscreet in assuring you that Winnie is very fond of you. I'm so glad. Come to luncheon tomorrow and have a talk with my little girl afterwards. I'll arrange it so that you can be undisturbed. That's most awfully good of you. No, not at all, not at all. Now I must be running home. I only looked in to see if there were any messages for me. And it was yours has made me very happy. Has Father returned, Aunt Sophie? I think I heard him just now. What's wrong? N nothing. I, uh, I merely have some news for him. I have had a very satisfactory afternoon. Where is Winnie? She's not yet back from hearing Mr. Railing's lecture on teetotalism. I can't still be talking. Father? Have you heard? Heard? Heard what? The Bishop of Barchester is dead. What, Andover? Well, this morning you said it would be a merciful release. Mm. Well, so it is. So it is. It is almost providential that that poor old man should depart this life on the very day that I am to meet Lord Stonehenge at dinner. Are you? Yes, at the Hollingtons. Well, you can hardly broach the subject tonight. Nonsense. Just before the election, the last time a bishopric was vacant, the Prime Minister practically assured me I would have the next. He probably did the same to half the schoolmasters of England. They have none of them half the claims I have. What about Inchthorpe? Or Runcible come to that? Inchthorpe was made dean less than 18 months ago. And Runcible is much too advanced. I thought your watchword was advanced. Advance and progress. My dear Sophia, surely even a woman can see that there is a deal of difference between an advancing conservative, uh, such as myself, and an advanced radical like Runcible. Tom Noddy, then. It's a ridiculous system that would give a man a bishopric because he's taught Latin verses to a parcel of stupid schoolboys. Besides, as the youngest son of the late Lord Chancellor, I think I may expect something from my country. From the way you're talking, I feel you might attack Lord Stonehenge physically. If it doesn't pass you the bishopric across the dinner table like the salt. I am not a vain man, but I esteem bashfulness ill-mannered and false modesty to be hypocritical. I honestly think I have a right to some recognition. As my father, the Lord Chancellor of England, often said... Really, Theodore, I wish to goodness you wouldn't talk of him as if he were your father only. Tommy and I have as much right to him as you. Clearly, you have had a very irritating afternoon. I am sorry. I shall have to leave you. Besides... It's time, I guess. Ah, there are times, Lionel, when I find your father the most insufferable man alive. Everyone thinks you'll get the bishopric. I hope he does, or life will be impossible for us all. It's only his manner. He is very effective in church. He is one of the most sought-after preachers in London. Mm, that's the trouble. Take my advice and don't try and copy him. I don't know how he gets away with it, but I'm positive nobody else could. 
He does a great deal of good. Oh, he does, I know. And if I didn't know that under all those words and airs of self-importance, he hadn't a genuinely good heart, I would never have agreed to come and look after you all when your poor mother died. Dear Aunt Sophie. Mm, I'm grateful he's only my younger brother. If he were head of the family instead of Tommy, he'd probably be as impossibly unpleasant as your grandfather, the late, unlamented Lord Chancellor. Mrs. Fitzherbert, it's a great pleasure to see you. <laughs> At last, you acknowledge my presence. Oh, come, Grace. We've known each other too many years with such an umbrageous tone. I had begun to feel the Prime Minister's daughter was to have all your attention throughout this. I was privileged to bring Lady Patricia down, but I had no idea I should be so fortunate as to have you on my other side. <laughs> Besides... <laughs> I believe you're about to pay me a compliment. I think you grow handsomer every day. <laughs> Thank you. Now, tell me about Sophie and the children. Oh, I would much sooner talk about you. <laughs> My dear Theo, as you pointed out, we've known each other far too long. Besides, for flattery to be pleasing, one must be convinced, at least for a moment, that it is sincere. And I've never concealed from you my belief that you are the most desperate humbug I've ever known. Grace, you put me at my ease at once. <laughs> now, Theo, tell me about Winnie. She's engaged to Harry Roxon. But that's marvellous news. You must be very pleased and proud. Well, of course. It's always satisfactory for a father to see his daughter happily married. Harry is an excellent fellow and quite comfortably off. Your understatement does you no credit. As you are fully aware, Roxham is the best party of the season. How long have they been engaged? Well, he hasn't spoken to her yet. What? But he and I have talked it over, and he's coming to luncheon tomorrow to make his declaration. You mean, Winnie hasn't been consulted? My dear lady, do you think that she'll refuse? Um, no. No, she's not her father's child for nothing. I look upon it as quite settled. And so there's only Lionel to dispose of. Lionel? Uh, hasn't he said anything? Said what? Well, unless I'm very much mistaken, he will shortly propose to Gwendolyn Durrant. And unless I'm equally mistaken, Gwendolyn Durrant intends to accept him. Are you, uh, you amaze me. I've, I've never even heard of the girl. Oh, of course you have. She's the daughter of Sir John Durrant. Durrant? The brewer? And one of the leading conservative backbenchers in the Commons. What? I never allow Lionel to marry anyone like that. I believe he's rather in love with her. Sir John is only a jubilee, Baronet. I would assume he was a city knight. The Gavins are very nice people. And prolific. Gwendolyn has six brothers. And Durrant was one of ten children, eight of whom were boys. Surely Lionel could fall in love with a girl of good family. I have it on excellent authority that Sir John proposes to give his daughter a hundred and fifty thousand pounds as her marriage portion. That is a very large sum. <laughs> it certainly may help the course of true love to run smooth. There's no wonder Lionel was disinclined to take the bishop's advice to become a total abstainer. It would really be rather uncivil. Uh, if he has matrimonial designs, or the brewer's daughter. I don't know if anything's settled yet. I merely tell you what I've observed. If you like, I'll invite the Durrants to luncheon, and you can see for yourself. Thank you. It would be delightful. Well, I'm not a man to stand in the way of his children's happiness. And if Lionel loves the girl, I'll put no obstacle in his way. Goodbye, Lady Hollington. Charming evening. <laughs> Ah, Lord Stonehenge. Hasn't it been a delightful evening? I presume you're waiting for Lady Patricia. A charming conversation with her when I took her down to dinner. Mm -hmm. <coughs> oh, Sprat. I'm sorry to see that poor Andover is dead. Mm. Oh. <coughs> He'll be a great loss and very difficult to replace. They say that he was the most learned of our bishops. Hmm. What did he die of? 
Oh, he was a very old man. My own conviction is that bishops ought to retire like ambassadors. A bishop should be a man of restless strength, active and versatile. To be a bishop, you want as much energy and resources as if you were manager of the army and navy stores. Who is manager of the army and navy stores? Uh, <laughs> I believe Andover was appointed to Barchester by uh, Mr. Gladstone. How oh, very large those grapes on that table are. Uh, yes. My father, the Lord Chancellor, used to grow very fine grapes at Beachcombe. You, you know, of course, that he held very decided views about the political opinions of bishops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't help agreeing with him. The Episcopal bench, I always think, would be a stronghold of Tory tradition. Uh, by the way, Lady Patricia persuaded me at dinner to address a primrose meeting later this month. Ah, uh, here is Lady Patricia. I hope you've not been waiting in a draft, Papa. Uh, well, Come I... Come along. Mm. Good night, Canon Scrap. Uh, good night, Lady Patricia. Good night, Lord Stonehenge. Very satisfactory. Thank heaven I'll never be as gross as that. Oh. <coughs> it was a very dull. Mm -hmm. The dinner was eatable. I hope you took no ice, Papa. I merely tasted it. I, I wonder why we cannot have ices like that. Ours are too cold. Lady Eastley was there. So it can't be true about Sir Archibald. The Huntingtons are always so careful. Which was she? The, the woman with the fat neck? Yes. She sat immediately opposite Canon Spratt. The Theodore Spratt wants me to make him a bishop. Well, he'll certainly keep his clergy in order. He's very energetic and clever. I prefer him stupid. I must ask Van Hatton if a tie... I believe I may have promised something for Spratt before the last election. Then you must give it to him and keep your promise. Why, I never thought we'd get in. His father was the most disagreeable man I ever saw. It wasn't his father you promised. I, I like my bishops tedious and rather old. And their clergy give them plenty to do and they don't meddle with the government. Canon Spratt is a staunch conservative. He'll only work for us as long as it pays him. Papa, he'll never become a radical. He's too anxious to become a gentleman. Oh, I prefer a radical to a liberal unionist. Oh, I must ask Van Hatton whether I definitely committed myself. Good morning, Lionel. Aunt Sophie. Bunsenby, is Miss Winnie down? She is down and already gone out, lady. So early. Do you know where she's gone, Lionel? No, but it's probably some scheme of railings. Hmm. She seems to be spending a lot of time on the work of that young man. He does a great deal of good amongst the poorer classes. Did she say when she would return, Bunsenby? I understand she will be home for luncheon, my lady. Good morning, Sophia. Lionel. Good morning, Father. Have you read the newspaper, Theodore? Yes, certainly. You may have it. Thank you. I hear that in spring a young man's fancy turns lightly to thoughts of love. I presume from that you had a pleasant evening at the Hollington. Little bird whispered to me that Master Cupid has been busy with you, my boy. I really don't know what you mean. Are you going to deny that you've cast a favourable eye upon Miss Gwendolyn Durrant? Oh, isn't that Sir John Durrant's daughter? His colour deepens. The whisper was correct. I like her very much, Father. You know, I find no fault in that. But I've not said anything to her, and I've no reason to believe that she cares for me at all. Oh, good heavens, there's no way to make love, Lionel. When I was your age, I never asked if there were any reason why a young woman should care for me. I am fond of her, but I... I don't know if I'm the right person for her. Only a foolish lover prates about his own unworthiness. If it's a fact, let the lady find it out for herself, after marriage. You would approve my asking Miss Durrant to marry me? My dear boy, the choice is yours. 
I will not conceal from you that I dislike her connection with trade. But we live in a different world from that of my boyhood. And after all, the Sprats are well enough born to put up with the trifling Miss Alliance. But I've not altogether made up my mind. Well, make it up. Don't think me cynical, but £150,000 will gild a more tarnished discussion than the Durrance. Besides, it's high time you were married. It's your duty to provide a male child to inherit the title. And I am assured that the Durrance run to boys. I'm not quite certain if I love her enough to marry her. Oh, don't talk such nonsense, dear boy. If you don't look sharp, upon my soul, I'll cut you out and marry her myself. No, you met her last evening. Oh, but I'm going to meet her father at luncheon this week, and the girl will probably be there. Which reminds me, Thomas is coming to luncheon, and young Harry Roxham. If you'll excuse me, I, I have some work to do. Certainly, my boy. Go and plan your campaign. You could do far worse than Miss Durrant. And don't forget, an old and honoured name depends on you. Yes, father. Grace Fitzherbert asked warmly after you at dinner, Mr. Farm. She was sitting on my other side. Dear Grace, I must ask her to take tea. One afternoon when you are out, it'll give us a chance to talk. Well, I don't pretend to understand you. Have you seen the notice about me? Notice? In the paper. I wish you took some interest in me. Where? Well, give it to me. Here. There is no truth in the rumour that Canon Spratt, vicar of St. Gregory, South Kensington, has been appointed to the vacant bishopric of Barchester. Did you submit that yourself, Theodore? Surely I recognise your incisive style. My dear Sophia. Yes? I think it reads very well. It's brief, pointed, I might almost say... Epigrammatic. Also, it reminds those in power that there is no more excellent candidate than the Vicar of St. Gregory. Oh, my dear sister, no one can call me a vain man, but I cannot think myself unsuitable to the position. I'm sure you'd be the last to deny that my parentage gives me certain claims upon my country. Mm, which you took care to point out to Lord Stonehenge last night. On the contrary, I flatter myself I was tactful enough to discuss the most indifferent matters with him. We talked of grapes and the manager of the Army and Navy stores. I merely remarked how sad it was that poor Andover was dead. It was excellent, dear, and I agree it is a most excellent hop. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, shall we go up? Mm. Oh, uh, Harry, a moment. Yes, uh, Thomas, you and Lionel go ahead. We shall be long. Uh, very well, Father. When Mary and the poor are broken up, I always do see him to sprinkle himself liberally with Keaton powder. <laughs> Harry, you will wait in my study and I shall send Winnie down. Oh, Canon. I feel most awfully nervous. Nonsense. There is nothing whatever to be nervous about. But Winnie hardly spoke once to me through luncheon. You have my complete assurance that Winnie undoubtedly cares for you. Oh, bless my soul. It reminds me of the day I asked my own dear wife to marry me. Come into How did your meeting go? It was truly splendid, Uncle. Mr. Railing is the most wonderful man I've ever seen in my life. Ah, is he? While Mr. Railing spoke, you could have heard a pin drop. And when he finished, they broke into such a storm of applause, I thought the roof would come down. Really? Well, I'm glad you enjoyed yourself, my dear. It isn't the enjoyment, Uncle. It's the example. Oh, there you are, Theo. But where's Harry? Is he gone? No, he's in my study. If you'll excuse me, Aunt, I have a meeting with the organist. Of course. And Lionel, if you can find a tactful moment, you might tell him that the Duchess of Otterton found his playing of the voluntary a little too flamboyant last week. Y yes, Father. Oh, dear me, how stupid I am. I meant to bring the paper up with me. Winnie, my love. Yes? Can you fetch it for me? Certainly, Papa. Thank you. I left it in the study. Oh. But Harry is there. Yes. I don't want to disturb him. You can't do that more than you already do. I think he has something to say to you. To me? What on earth can he want? Oh, he will tell you himself, my love. Oh. Oh, I can't see him. Oh, my dear, you must. I don't want to. I quite understand that you feel a certain bashfulness. But I must speak to you first. Oh, come, 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 my dear. It's nothing so very terrible. 
Well, go downstairs like a good girl. And I dare say you'll bring Harry up with you. Oh, Papa. Now, go along, child. Oh. A little maidenly modesty. So oh, charming, so oh, pretty. It's a lovely sight, my dear Sophia. That of the typical English girls, fused in the blushes of virginal innocence. Fiddlesticks. You're a cynic, my dear. It's a grave fault. I beg you not to preach to me, Theodore. No man is a prophet in his own country. But Thomas. Mm. No one wonder why I sent you that urgent note asking you to luncheon. Not at all. I can quite understand that the pleasure of my company is worth a special messenger. I ask you to come in your official capacity, if I may so call it, as head of the family. My dear brother, merely by courtesy. I am unworthy. The fact is sufficiently patent without you recalling it. I should be obliged if, at this moment, when the affairs of our house are at stake, you would adopt such sobriety and decorum as you are capable. Hmm. I wish I got on my coronation robes. Oh, go on, Theodore. You will be gratified to hear that Lord Roxham has asked my permission to pay his addresses to any. My young days, when a man wanted to marry, he asked the girl before he asked the father. I'm so old-fashioned as to consider a father the best judge of his daughter's welfare. Roxham is a young man of the highest principles, and he naturally chose the correct course. He's a very eligible young man, and he has my full approval. Supposing she should take it into her head to marry that socialist Johnny. She told me he was the most wonderful man she'd ever seen. <laughs> young Grayling, absurd. Oh, granted, she's impressed by his talk, any young girl would be. My daughter knows what is due to herself and to her family. Winnie, my dear child. Papa? Uh, where is your young man? Why haven't you brought him upstairs with you? Papa? Harry asked me to marry him. Well, I know, I know. He did it with my full approval. Well, I hope you won't be angry. You wouldn't want me to do anything I didn't like. Now, child, what do you mean? I had to say that I couldn't. You had what? Uh, what is this? You're joking. <laughs> Where is Harry? He's gone. Gone? He left before I came up. Well, this, this is another joke. I'm quite bewildered by all this humour. I don't love him, Father. Sophia, the girl has taken leave of her senses. No. Oh, Wendy, what have you said to Harry Roxham? I told him I couldn't marry him. Couldn't? Uh, what is this couldn't? I couldn't marry him because... Because... Well, because of what, child? Because I'm already engaged to someone else. <laughs> no! no! Engaged? I'm engaged to Bertram Rayling. But Winnie, your father explained it. He's only a common Rayling. Thomas, you will leave this house. You have joked too far. Very well, Theodore. I've no wish that you wash your dirty linen before me. I ask you to go. I'm on my way. Goodbye, Sophie. <laughs> Never mind, Winnie. Remember, I'll always back you in something unreasonable. Well, I hope you all will have a very nice time. Theodore, perhaps it would be Do better you, if I... Yes, Sophia. Winifred, am I to understand that you are serious? Yes. You seriously tell me you are engaged, that man, of whom no one knows anything, that penniless scribbler, that rogue and vagabond... You yourself said he was a man of great intellect. He is a charlatan. You said you greatly admired him. That merely proves that I have good manners. Oh, Theodore, you're being ridiculous. Enough. I just had to order the head of our family from the house for indecent frivolity. I hope you will not force me to take other measures. How long has this absurd business been going on? I agreed to marry Bertram yesterday. But I have not been consulted. You don't understand, Papa. Understand? Can't you see what he's done for me? He's taught me everything I know. I was a fool, vain and stupid. He has made me a woman, and one ashamed of what she was. But I'm proud now. He's the first real man I've ever met. And just what do you find in him that you cannot find in Roxham or in me? I don't love Harry. A girl your age doesn't know what love is. I cannot make you marry Roxham. And I can accept your refusal of him as the will of Providence. And shall do my best to bear it. But I will not accept that it is the will of Providence that you who marry Bertram Railing. I refuse to give my consent to this grotesque proposal. The man's a scoundrel. Nothing better than a, a fortune hunter. That is not true. You have no right to abuse the man I love. I have given Bertram my solemn promise. I'm over 21 and my own mistress. 
And what do you mean by that? If you won't give your consent, I shall marry without it. Uh, this is my reward for all the affection lavished upon my children. For all their lives, I have sacrificed myself to their every whim. And this is my reward. Winnie, do you know anything about the young man? Has he got anything to live on? We shall both work, Aunt Sophie. And with the extra he makes from his writing, plus the little I have from my mother, we shall live like kings. In a villa in the Holmes' eyes, I presume. Theodore. Well, I know it's a delicate question, but had he a father, or did he just grow? His father is dead. He was first mate on a collier, trading from Newcastle. Mm, that, I should imagine, as a profession, is neither lucrative nor clean. Let us be thankful his relations are dead. He has a mother and a sister. Who are they? I don't know or care. He has told me his mother is not a highly educated woman. So I should suppose. Where are they? They have a little house in Peckham. Revolting. I wish to hear nothing more. Papa, please don't go. I know you love me, and I love you. Next to Bertram, I love you better than anyone in the world. You say you love me. How can you cause me such pain? Papa. I change nothing that I have said. I will leave you to your reflections. It is only from a regard to your sex and out of respect for the memory of your dead mother that I don't tell you I consider you more than stupid. I consider you vulgar. felt it was safe to return. I have missed you, dear Tommy, since Theodore turned you from the house. I hope you bear no grievance. Not in the least. The earth's cook is far too good. Oh, it's been impossible here. Lionel hides himself in work and avoids any but the most cursory conversation. Theodore and Winnie haven't spoken to each other, but use me as a verbal post office. She's going ahead. It appears so. Hmm. Where's Theo now? He was lunching with Mrs. Fitzherbert to meet Sir John Durrant and his daughter. Having failed with the filly, he hopes the colt will bring him more luck. And the more our brother embraces the match, the more our nephew is inclined to evade it. Another disaster. Oh, well, any word about Barchester? No. Theodore will fight when he's married, and he could claim a victory, yes. Oh, when he's like a father and grandfather, obstinate. <laughs> I can't see her giving in. She may not give in, but allow her the woman's privilege of changing her mind. Mm. Yes, the uh, perhaps I shouldn't stay. Oh, don't be such a coward, Tommy. You've got to see him sometime. I'm not one for upsets. Never have been. Too uncomfortable and too unnecessary. You're too late. Mm, pity I'm too young to jump from the window. <laughs> too scandalous. Capital, <laughs> there is laughter in the house. My dear brother, I am delighted to see you. Mm. We missed these seven days, and we look to you to bring humor into our home. I can think of no greeting more guaranteed to make a man forget a joke. I have had a delightful afternoon. Government is an excellent fellow, and for a brewer in politics, as honest as I have met. I wasn't aware you'd met any others. His daughter is a charming girl. She'll make any young man an exemplary wife. Though his father, and shouldn't say it, she's worth six of Lionel. Well, let us hope she isn't aware of it. And where is Winnie? Winnie? My daughter, your niece. There has been a slight misunderstanding between us. It is time it was settled. Well, she's with Mr. Rayling. She told me she was to meet his mother this afternoon. Excellent. What do you mean? It is only proper that when a young woman becomes engaged, she should meet the relations of her fiancé. Are you agreeing to the engagement? One must allow one's children, after they have passed a certain age, to decide some matters for themselves. You never have before. Though a clever woman, Sophia, you're not quite so clever as your humble servant. Hmm. Thomas, with all these matrimonial schemes, are you going to cling to bachelordom? In your position of head of our family, you are aware you must marry money. No, oh, that, monsieur, I would like a shot. What I object to is marrying a wife. Now, if you'll forgive me, I have an appointment in Westminster. Westminster? Then we must not keep you from your duties in the house. The house? Is a public one, and the appointment <laughs> concerns some horses. Goodbye, Sophie. Good gracious. I believe Thomas was offended by my railway. Oh, what has happened? 
Why, after a week of editation, do you now make jokes in doubtful taste? I hope I don't do that, Sophia. Some mild teasing will only lighten the atmosphere of ponderous thought that has filled this house since certain serious decisions were taken. It should do nothing but good. When is Winnie expected home? Shortly. She was only having tea with Mrs. Railing. Oh, then I must wait. With patience for her return. Ah, oh, Winnie. Back from the wilds of farthest Beckham. Hello, Father. You don't look too well, my dear. But you're not sickening for something? I have a slight headache. Oh, my child. I'm sorry. I hope that your long journey hasn't been too much for you. No. And how was your prospective mother-in-law? Mrs. Railing was very kind. Of course. Though I imagine she wasn't uh, polished. I didn't expect her to be. True disinterestedness is such a beautiful thing. And in this world, alas, so rare. I mean to marry Bertram, Father. Oh, my darling girl. Whoever suggested you shouldn't. Do you mean that? Oh, I'm not a hard father, my dear. And seeing that you have set your heart upon it, and have now faced up to meeting your future relations, I withdraw my opposition completely. Oh, Papa, thank you. By the way, do they call him Bertie? Yes. I thought they would. But tell me about Mrs. Railing. And the sister, isn't it? Yes. But Louise Railing wasn't there. She works in a library. Very estimable. Uh, but uh, the mother... Ageless, I presume. Yes. But she was very kind. Uh, so you told me. And I have no doubt you'll accustom yourself to their little eccentricities of diction. Or to their slight vulgarities of manner. And this will be all the easier if you have found already the warmth and charm which lies beneath them. Yes, Papa. Oh, my child, you are clearly tired from your journey. Why not take a rest? Oh, oh, before you go up, what is the address of Mrs. Rainey? The address? What do you want it for? Oh, come. Nothing improper, is it? It's Balmoral, Rosebury Gardens, Gladstone Road. Their liberalism is evidently a family tradition. I consider it my duty to be as cordial as possible to your future relations. I shall ask Mrs. Railing and her daughter to tea. Oh, Father. Well, I feel that your uncle should meet them. Father, you don't know what they're like. I don't expect to find them highly educated, but from all you've told me, they appear to have good hearts. I'm fully prepared to like Mrs. Railing, my dear. But, Papa, please don't ask anyone else. She drinks. Well, we all have our failings in this world. Pa, I hope you don't think I can break my engagement with Bertram. I've given him my solemn promise. Theodore, either tell us what is in that letter you keep waving about in that idiotic way or put it down. My dear Sophia, I don't know what you mean. This is a note from Mrs. Raymond saying she will be delighted to come to tea on Thursday. You're continuing with this charade? I don't pretend to understand you. Lionel, my boy, you will have to take the two funerals that afternoon. Certainly, Father. Whose are they? Persons of no consequence, but they require burial. As a matter of fact, I believe one of them was our fishmonger. Oh, I thought the fish had been inferior the last few days. Is Winnie going with you, my boy, to the Crampton's ball tonight? Y yes, Father. Good. Well, I shall accompany you. What are you up to, Theodore? You don't like balls. You always say there are far too many people. There are times one feels in need of a change. be able to persuade you to dance with me, Miss Black. Thank you so much. But will you excuse me a moment? I'd rather just watch. Then let me fetch you something. No, no, really. Thank you all the same. But please don't let me stop you from dancing yourself. Thank you. Excuse me. Hello. Hello. You startled me. You're looking very delightful. Thank you. I knew I should find you here. That's why I came. You're not angry with me. I wanted to see you so badly. Good heavens, no. Why should I be angry? You've as much right to come as I. I can't keep away from you. I didn't know I loved you so much. Oh, please, Harry. We've been friends for ages. It would be absurd if we couldn't see each other again, just because... because of the other day. I couldn't take your answer as final. Oh, I don't want to bother you and make you miserable, but don't you think that after a time you may get to like me? I told you the other day it was impossible. I know, but then I couldn't say what I wanted. I love you so passionately Don't that it's... Don't say anything more. Not just now. It's very, very kind of you. And I don't know how to thank you. 
But I can't marry you. Oh. May I just tell you one thing? Please. You shouldn't. It's just that if you should change your mind, ever, I shall be waiting for you. I can never love anyone else. I don't want you to make any promise or give me any encouragement, but I want you to know that I shall wait. If the time comes when you can care for me, you will find me ready and eager to be your very humble servant. I didn't know you were so kind. I'm sorry, I want you to be happy. But don't be wretched because I can't marry you. I'm not worth troubling about. Is there something the matter? I, I have a slight headache, that's all. Excuse me if I slip away. Goodbye, dear Harry. I shall never forget your kindness. Awesome, my dear boy. I'm delighted to see you. What a crowd, isn't that? I've been dying to find someone to have a quiet cigarette with me. Will you join me? Certainly, Danny. The smoking room is empty. Let's make ourselves at home. Oh. I've been talking with Winnie. Have you? Well? I don't understand her. No, my dear fellow, there's nothing to understand. People say women are incomprehensible. They're nothing of the sort. I think she'd been crying. All women cry when they've nothing better to do. It's the only inexpensive form of amusement they have. I asked her to marry me. And of course she refused. Yes. That was to be expected. Huh? No girl accepts a man the first time he proposes to her. <laughs> My dear Harry, the way with women is to insist. Treat them kindly but firmly. Remember the majority never know their own minds. And between you and me, the majority haven't much mind to know. But Winnie's so different from other girls. Nonsense. Every man thinks the girl he wants to marry is different from any other. There's nothing of the kind. The women are much of a muchness, especially the pretty ones. No, my dear Harry, you have my full approval and my assurance that Winnie undoubtedly cares for you. What more can you want? Hammer away. Propose to her, in season and out. Ask her morning, noon and night. Insist upon marrying her. Sooner or later, she'll say yes and think herself prodigious fool for not having said so before. You're very encouraging. Now, what do you propose to do? I don't know. My dear fellow, God helps those who help themselves. You want to marry my little girl? And I want you to marry her. But what can I do? Well, I see I must help you a little. Come and have lunch with us on Friday. Come early. I have reason to believe you'll find Winnie in a very different state of mind. I don't want to be a bore. But don't talk such nonsense. You won't be. Now, I advise you to go home. Have a good night's sleep. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Miss Durland. Can you? Good evening. How is it the young men are so ungallant as to leave you sitting out? I am engaged to your son, Mr. Durant. I can't make out where he is. The Lionel is a donkey. Give it to me instead. Well, I don't know that I should. Well, of course you must. I, as his father, claim it as a forfeit. Very well. <laughs> Thank you. Gwendolyn, I'm... I'll cut you out, dear boy. I'll cut you out. Come, Miss Durant. You were rather unkind to him. Nonsense. To teach him to be more punctual. If I'd been engaged to the bell of the evening, I wouldn't have kept her waiting for a single moment. You dance better than mine. You mustn't think that because my hair is nearly white that I am quite an old fossil. Will you bear me no malice because I robbed you of your partner? N not at all. I'm not very fond of dancing. You young men are so superior these days. It's a monstrous thing when a girl's pretty feet itch for a varnished floor that she should be forced to resort to the arms of an old fogey like myself. It didn't look as if she needed much compulsion. <laughs> Have you declared yourself yet? Have my paternal blessing. She's a nice girl and I think we'll get on capitally together. No, I haven't. Well, do it, my boy. It's your duty to marry. 
I think you'll have to hunt a long time before you find anyone so likely to provide all that's necessary as Gwendolyn Durrant. Uh, I like her very much, of course. Then go and propose to her. Propose tonight. I think like a ball for that sort of thing. She makes me rather nervous. Fiddlesticks. Take her into the conservatory. Hold her hand. The rest will follow. Or you're no son of mine. Propose to Gwendolyn tonight and perhaps I'll pay a bill or two for you in the morning. But I have no outstanding bills. Oh. Uh, Go along. Have you heard? Yes. He read it like everyone else in the morning paper. The announcement that Dr. Gray had been appointed to the vacant bishopric of Barchester caused breakfast to be shrouded in a black cloud of purple vituperation. Yep, it seems to be catching. Huh? In this house, it isn't surprising. Poor Theodore. He can't have helped the Greys, headmaster of Harbin's. No, there were a number of words about episcopal positions going to trumpery schoolmasters. <laughs> well, he stormed out afterwards. And though I heard him come in, I hadn't seen him. Well, I told him when Andover died not to expect too much. He never listens to us, my dear. He listens. He only hears what he wants. Mm. Is the railing steep party still going ahead? Oh, yes. This afternoon at four o'clock. I hope when his new relations are entertaining, or we're in for a sticky afternoon. Excuse me, my lady. Sir John Durrant has called to see the canon. Isn't he in the study? No, my lady. Oh. Well, show Sir John in here. And go and look for the canon. I'm sure I heard him come in. Very good. Do you think Lionel's proposed at last? Oh, it's not possible. He hadn't this morning. And he's spending the day taking funerals. Sir John Durham. Lady Sophia, I apologize for bursting in upon you like this. I had hoped to find the canon at home. Oh, Sir John. My brother is in, and he should be down directly. Do you know my elder brother, Lord Spratt? How do you do, sir? Delighted to meet you. Can we be of help? I'm afraid not. I've come to thank Canon Spratt for saving my daughter's life. Theo did? This morning, in the park. Her horse was frightened, tried to throw her, and would have bolted if it hadn't been for your brother. My dear Dunn, do forgive me. I was upstairs. Not at all, sir. I've just seen Gwendolyn, and she has told me of your bravery in saving her from a nasty accident. Uh, it was nothing, I assure you. I happened to be near. I don't know how to thank you. Well, there is no need, and I am flattered that you should call upon us. But if you will allow me to say it, I think it is incautious to let her ride alone. I've offered to accompany her tomorrow. Oh, that is most good of you, Canon. Uh, Gwendolyn refuses to ride with the groom. But I'm afraid that you will find it a great bore. Not at all. I assure you it will be a great pleasure. Some time ago, my doctor advised me to take horse exercise. And I should be only too glad to have someone so charming to ride with. It's generous of you to say so. Think no more of it. Please take a glass of sherry with us. Thank you. <laughs> I trust your affairs are flourishing? In point of fact, they're not. The confounded government wants to give the local justices power to close a certain proportion of the public houses in their districts. Well, I understood that it will have no influence on the consumption of liquor. Lord Stonehenge maintains the remaining houses will profit. Don't you believe it, Lady Sophia? Nine times out of ten, a man doesn't drink a glass of beer because he's thirsty, but because there's a public house at his elbow. The government seemed very strong on the point. Probably they've been got hold of by the faddists and abstainers, eh, dear? Mark my words, the government doesn't know how strong we are. If they try to interfere with our trade, it will be a bad day for them. I shall fight them tooth and nail and carry the whole trade with me. Well, the Conservative majority isn't a very large one. Yeah, precisely. It's in a wobbly state. And if they put my back up, I won't answer for the consequences. It would seem, Darren, that you have Lord Stonehenge over a barrel. <laughs> it could be. But I mustn't be tedious. Forgive me. Thank you again, Canon, for what you did for my daughter. If you'll excuse me, I'll be leaving you. Well, you must come to dinner one evening, Sir John, and bring your daughter. Both my brother and his son speak so highly of her, I can't wait to meet her. It will be a great pleasure, Lady Sophia. Uh, goodbye, Lord Spratt. Goodbye, Canon. Canon. Goodbye. Sensible fellow, in a sensible business. You appear to have been very courageous this morning, dear Doc. 
Congratulations. Well, nothing very serious, I assure you. May I say how sad I was to read about Barchester this morning? Cleo, I'm sorry. Thank you, Thomas. It was a surprise, certainly. But thinking it over, Barchester's rather off the beaten track, and I'm probably doing more worthwhile work here in London. Mm. I'm pleased to find you free of your usual flippancy today, my dear brother. For at this tea this afternoon, I feel it could be somewhat out of place. I should do my best to do you credit. Not me. Just remember that we are the family of the late Lord Chancellor of England. And for people such as the Railings, we have a position. And it wouldn't do for them to feel any of us uh, were not worthy of it. It's a nice neighborhood, dear. South Kensington. Uh, it's the least unpleasant of the suburbs. My dear, I cannot allow you to call South Kensington a suburb. Well, unlike the hamlet, which was funny without being vulgar, South Kensington is like Bayswater without being funny. Oh, yes. Peckham's nice. I'm sure it is, Mrs. Rayleigh. We're lucky, mind. We have the electric light and a bathroom. Bert, he has to take his bath every morning. They say that cleanliness is next to godliness. That I don't deny. But one has to be careful. I've heard of those who took cold and died through having a bath when they wasn't feeling up to it. Tea, Miss Rayleigh? Thanks. No sugar. I think it's weak. The tea? I'm so sorry. No, to take sugar. I don't approve of hydrocarbons. Uh, Louise. Yes, Bertie. Uh, this is Wendy. Ah. You weren't in the other day when I came to Peckham with your brother. I was attending a meeting on the independent role of women and her rights. He should have bought you. I'm afraid I had a train to catch. Uh, yes, there wasn't time. There is always time. But as Bertie and I share the opinion that most women only waste time, I shall be able to take you in hand. Do you also share your brother's talent for oratory, Miss Rayleigh? You should just hear her. Once she gets going, there's no stopping her. I hold with women taking part in everything. There's an immense field for women's activities. You should just see her certificates and prizes. Oh, Ma, you make people think I'm a child. What's the point of having them if no one knows you've got them? Uh, but now, how do you take your tea, Mrs. Rayleigh? Oh, I don't pay no attention to all this stuff of Bertie and Louie's. Sometimes they give me the arm, I can tell you. Ma, well, you don't. Do mind what you're saying. It's always the same, Your Grace. When your children grow up and get on in the world, they want to turn everything upside down. What do you think Bertie wants me to do now? I can't imagine. He wants me to take the pledge. Mother! It's true. But what I say is, Your Grace, I'm an hard-working woman, and I want me to drop a beer now and then. When I was left a widow, I had to work hard to bring up the three children and make ends meet. You have another child. Oh, there's poor Florrie. She's my eldest. Ain't quite right in the head. So we had to send her to the asylum. Most unfortunate. But with Bertie and Louis, they both had a thorough good education. Well, you have every reason to be proud of them. I don't suppose my little girl has half the knowledge of Miss Louise. Well, that's your fault. You haven't educated her properly. But then there's no higher education of women in the West End. Once I've had charge of her for six months, she'll be a different woman. I have no doubt. Ain't she wonderful? Anything but anybody she does. Oh, I could listen to Louis talking for hours at a time. Except on the subject of teetotalism. <laughs> <laughs> You're right there. Capital. <laughs> Capital. You mustn't <laughs> laugh at me, Your Grace. But the fact is, I sometimes, only once in a while, mind... Like a little drop in me tea. Well, bless you. Why didn't you say so? Winnie, you ought to have told me. Ring the bell. Father. Ring the bell. Oh, I didn't mean... I wasn't intending. Dear lady, of course you must have something. Surely this is an occasion that would classify as once in a while. What is it to take? Rum? Oh, I can't bear it. Whiskey? Certainly not, Your Grace. Gin? Call it white satin, my lord. White satin. It's a funny thing now, but rum has never agreed with me. It's wholesome, you know. Oh, I have no doubt. You rang. Bonsonby, have we any white satin in the house? White satin, sir. I'll inquire. I've heard it called satinette. Or satinette? Satinette, sir. Perhaps you do not quite understand, Bonsonby. I mean, have we any gin in the house? Gin, sir? No, sir. Is there none in the servants' hall? No, sir. Oh, how careless of me. 
Sophia, you ought to have reminded me that there was no gin. Well, Ponsonby, you will go out and get six pennies from the nearest public house. Oh, don't send out for it. I'll never forgive myself. Oh, I assure you it's no trouble. And I should very much like to taste it. Well, then, three pennies is ample. You're better without it, Ma. Oh, come, come. You mustn't grudge your mother a little treat. And it's a real treat for me. Three pennies of gin, Ponsonby. Very well. That's what I like about London. There's always a public house at the corner. For once, I'm in agreement with the present government. There are far too many. I agree with Mrs. Raylin. It is most convenient. Do you? And may I ask if you have ever studied the tea total question? Oh, no. And you, a hereditary legislator. I'd like a few words with you about the House of Lords. I'm a radical, and the House of Lords must go. I'll part from it without a tear. What moral right have you to rule over me? <laughs> My dear young lady, if I do, it is entirely unaware. I'm not concerned with you personally. To you as a person, I am completely indifferent. You crush my self-esteem. I wish to discuss the matter with you as a member of the privileged class. So far as I can see, you are utterly ignorant of all the great social questions of the day. Utterly. What do you know of the housing of the workers? Nothing. Secondary education? Nothing. Taxation of the ground rents? Nothing. Precisely. Well, I don't want to know. You are a member of the upper chamber just because you're a lord. You have the power to legislate over millions of people with ten times more knowledge, more ability, and more education than yourself. Excellent. You rub it in, Miss Railing. How do you spend your time? Well, I... Just... Do you study the questions of the house? Do you try to fit yourself to the task entrusted to you by the anachronism of a past age? Well, please, Miss Raylin, put your umbrella down. It's making me nervous. I'll be bound you spend your day in every form of degrading pursuit. Race meetings, gambling, billiards, and golf. Capital, capital. A good straight talking to is what he's needed for years. Excuse me, sir. Ah, uh, here's the gin. Oh, don't call it gin, your grace. It sounds so vulgar. Will you come this way, son? Uh, thank you. The Canon Spratt will join you in the drawing room presently. Lord Roxon, Miss Winifred. Oh, hello, Harry. Hello, Winnie. You look very charming arranging those flowers. Thank you. What does it come to? He loves me not. It's not true. He loves you passionately. He always will. Won't you speak to me? What do you want me to say? Anything. Or nothing. I only want for you what you want for yourself. Oh, Harry, I'm so dreadfully unhappy. I don't know what to do. Can't you love me, Winnie? Did you mean it when you told me never to hope? Was it only a week ago I said that? Nine days. Oh, I utterly despise myself. But why? Why? Do you really care for me? You're all I care for in the world. You're my very life. I love you with all my heart and all my soul. I think I like to hear you say that. Oh, Winnie. I want someone so badly to care for me. Tell me what's the matter. I may be able to help. Dear Harry, you're so kind. Far nicer than I ever thought. Please, don't torture me. Do you remember when I first saw you? You came here from Eton with Lionel, and you were dreadfully shy. But we became great friends. How angry you used to get when I beat you at tennis. You never did, except <laughs> when I let you. That's what you always said, but I didn't believe you. Do you remember when I used to punt you up and down the river? <laughs> How frightened I was when you fell in. That's not true. You roared with laughter. Oh, what lovely days those were. But we used to quarrel quite dreadfully. Only for the pleasure of making it up. I wonder when you first began to like me. I've never liked you. I've always loved you, passionately. <laughs> Even when I wore a pigtail and had square-toed boots? Even then, and I always will. I can't live without you. Are you sure? Say you'll marry me. I'll do anything to make you happy. Dearest Winnie, kiss me. I love you. My dear, how delightful to see you. I'm sorry I was delayed. Broke your business, you understand. Oh, uh, may I tell him? Yes. Canon Spratt, 
Winnie has just promised to be my wife. What? Oh, my dear children, I'm delighted. All's well that ends well. I told you she was devoted to my boy. Trust me for knowing a woman's character. Excuse me, sir. Yes? Mr. Railing has called. He asked for Miss Winifred. Yes, he? I showed him into the study, sir. You did say you wanted to see him. I'll see him at once. How good of you to come, Railing. Delighted to see you. Winnie told me she'd be at home. My dear friend, I didn't flatter myself that you'd come to see me. In fact, I've been wanting to have a little chat with you. Of course, Cameron. A serious step that you young people are taking. Then we're wise to take it with a light heart. And as to being young, I am 28 and Winnie over 21. Yeah, true, true. Did you smoke? Uh, no, thank you, I don't. No vices, I see. Hmm. And now let us discuss the matter cordially. There is no need for me to tell you that I have the highest esteem for you and the sincerest admiration for your talents. Thank you. We live in an age when talent is not always rewarded according to its merit. To be frank, I'm curious to know upon what you propose to live. My own income is about 150 annually, and, and Winnie has 300 a year from her mother. You are well informed. Winnie told me. <laughs> Obviously. I didn't suppose you'd examine the will at Somerset House. Uh, you imagine that Winnie will be content to live on 450 pounds a year. It's three times as much as my mother had. Possibly. Uh, but your mother, a most excellent and delightful person, really, uh, don't misunderstand me, has moved in a rather different stratum of society from my daughter. <laughs> but do you think Winnie cares two straws for the tawdry trappings of society? I think my daughter is human, and I confess I suspect a carriage and pair may be essential to her happiness. I know Winnie and love her, Canon. You think she's a doll and a fool. Well, she may have been. Now she's a real woman and loathes the shams and shallowness of society. Yeah, she said that. But my word, we spat her a keen sense of humor. Her life was a mockery. She didn't know what life was. You think she cares for carriages and fine clothes now? She had no aspirations, she had no ideals, and of course she wasted herself on fashionable frivolities. But now, thank God, now, she knows how narrow is this circle of idle, selfish people. She wants to work, she wants to labor, she wants to stand shoulder to shoulder with her fellow men and fight. My boy, do you honestly think it would ever have occurred to Winnie that this world, uh, her world, if you like, was hollow and foolish if you had had a squint eye or a wart upon your nose? But that is a monstrous argument, sir. You think that all people are bad. On the contrary. I think only that most of them are foolish. You sneer at the new life which fills your daughter's eyes. You no longer know her. Oh, I know she loves me. You may think that I'm a fortune hunter, but you're wrong. We don't want your money. We have no need, nor will we know what to do with it. You are content that she should sacrifice everything for you. She throws away painted husks, dross and tinsel. She gains the whole world. Which means you and a villa in Peckham. Upon my soul. You are very modest. What are you driving at? Well, out with it. I beg you to observe the conventions of polite society. Conventions? <laughs> it is the duty of any father to inquire into the circumstance of a young man who proposes to marry his daughter. Oh, 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 I know you despise me, but don't humbug me as well. Mr. Railing, I solemnly ask you to give up my daughter. After mature consideration, I have reached the conclusion that this marriage is impossible, and I will never give my consent to it. We'll do without it. We're both free. Winnie has promised to marry me, and by God, she shall. It is painful for me to have to talk to you in this manner. It is true that a short time ago I gave my provisional agreement to your engagement, and it is understandable you should find it strange if I now refuse it. But certain facts coming to my knowledge force me to do so. Your eldest sister is unfortunately in a lunatic asylum. I regret the misfortune. But with insanity in your family. But that's absurd. Florrie had an accident as a child. She fell down. Since then, she's been... Not quite right in the head, as your mother put it. Every child falls, but the entire human race is not so imbecile as to need restraint. I don't believe a word you say. You produce this for want of anything better. It is, as I've said, sir, pure humbug. Tell me the simple truth, if you can. Are you quite sure that Winnie cares for you? sure as I am of my own life. It is my painful duty to inform you that you are mistaken. What? Winnie has realized she has misjudged the strength 
of her affection. I, I don't believe it. Mr. Railing, you exhaust my patience. Well? Winnie has requested me to tell you that she finds she doesn't care enough for you to marry you. She deeply regrets the unhappiness she has caused and asks you to release her. It's a lie. You will have the goodness to remember that I'm a minister of the church. You forced her to do this. I know she loves me. You may think what you like. The fact remains, she wishes to break off this engagement. You tell me I am a man of honor and then treat me like a lackey. My whole life's happiness is at stake. It is not true. On my honor as a gentleman. Then let her tell me herself. She has gone out. But I... But she was expecting me. Precisely. She chose not to be here. Doesn't that show you that I have spoken the simple truth? I wish to spare you both. A painful scene. No. No, I... I can't believe you. What an escape. What an escape. Hello? I am. You've seen the paper this morning. As you insist on being the first to read it, and have not yet seen fit to pass it amongst us, I can't see how we could have. What is it, Father? A dreadful thing has happened. Dr. Gray has had an apoplectic stroke and died last night. Poor man. He hasn't enjoyed his bishopric long. I look upon it as a judgment of providence. What on earth do you mean? I said at the time he was not fit to go to Barchester. I have no doubt the strain and excitement proved too much for him. You see, I was right. When will men learn to put a rein upon their ambition? Especially when such as you set them such a good example. You are talking nonsense again, Sophia. If you will excuse us, I would like a few words with Lionel. Certainly. I'll go and speak to Cook. Now, Lionel. Yes, Father? Uh, I think you have finished Hallett long enough. I want to know what you intend to do with regard to Gwendolyn Dunn. To do with her? Oh, good Lord, man. What a perfect fool are you? We've discussed your marriage to her ad nauseam. We've hardly spoken of it. Don't quibble. It's not fair on the girl to keep her dangling like this. Are you going to marry her or not? Well, there's no hurry. On the contrary, there's the greatest possible hurry. Why? There's every reason to believe that someone else is thinking of proposing to her. Oh. Well, I, I don't think she cares tuppence about me. Lately, whenever I've seen her, she does nothing but talk about you. Well, there are less diverting subjects for conversation. One can have too much of a good thing. If you don't look sharp, someone will step in and cut you out. I warn you candidly. I shan't break my heart. I don't know what young men are coming to. No spirit, no enterprise. And you've been warned. So you mustn't be surprised, whatever happens. Well, if you want her in the family so much, I wonder you don't marry her yourself. Well, what would you say if I did? <laughs> I'd wish you luck. Well, let me tell you that a man of 50 is in the very flower of his age. Where are you going? Out! Ah, Miss Durrant, would you have been disappointed if I hadn't? Awfully. Oh, you make me regret I'm not 25. Why? Because if I were, I should promptly ask you to marry me. If you were, I should probably refuse you. Yes. Come on! Oh, it's ridiculous. Here I am, the man you see as old as your father, Yet my heart is as young as it ever was. You're not a bit like my father. He doesn't dance, but you do. And he won't ride, but you do. I never feel you're any older than I am. Nearly 50. Think you're fishing for compliments. Oh, oh Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn, I sometimes think you have worked a miracle. Oh, you can make fun of me if you like. By your side, I feel as young as a summer morning. I admire you and love you. Do you find me ridiculous? No. No, not in the least. Gwendolyn, will you be my wife? Theodore. What about Lionel? Lionel? Lionel can go to the Dickens. <laughs> now for my answer. I 
I'll race you to the end. It's all settled then. I'm satisfied and you tell me that you're satisfied. My dear Darren, your generosity overwhelms me. I promise you I'll do my very best to make her happy. I don't know what you've done to the girl. She's quite infatuated. Oh, she's made me the happiest of men. And I am delighted that something good has happened to brighten up these past grey weeks. Mm, they're going ahead with the public house legislation. They are. And the devil of it is that if we in the liquor faction go against it, the government will fall. We are as strong as that. We are. And they're all looking to me for a lead. The cartoonists are having a field day. Did you see the one in the morning post of Stonehenge on his knees, bowing to me dressed as some Turkish pasha, sitting on a beer barrel? No. Uh, whatever they say, he's not going to give way. And then he can always point to me and say I was the one who split the party and brought us down. And you don't want to? If there was an election tomorrow, we'd all be out and out here. To Stonehenge, it's a small domestic matter, and we've no right to stand out like this. But it's our business he's attacking. You do irreparable harm to the party if you do stand firm. I know. My dear fellow, I'm full of sympathy for your thinking. But if the Liberals got into power, they would have to face much more serious legislation. I've spent a long time on this and will no doubt spend a lot more. If there is anything I can do to help, you have but to call on me. You know that. And I, if you'll forgive me, I must thank you for the delightful luncheon and, uh, with your permission, I will go upstairs and say goodbye to Gwendolyn. You're not going. Unfortunately, I must. I have a busy afternoon ahead of me. You can imagine that it is not without weighty reason that I tear myself away from this house, which now holds my heart. <laughs> Put like that, I, I suppose I must let you go. You're a clever man, Theodore, and the first understanding clergyman I've ever met. You should be a bishop. Thank you. It is an honor which I may yet be granted. I hope we can see you for dinner. Alas, no. Not this evening, it is impossible. Winnie is returning from the country. She is to marry Roxham, as you know, and she's been visiting his mother. And it would be unkind not to dine at home. Very well, but when will we see you again? May I call later this evening for about half an hour? I look forward to it. Gabby, it's half a sovereign for you if you get me to the Athenaeum in the next three minutes. Afternoon, Lord Stonehenge. Mm hmm. Oh, Spratt. Did you see this cartoon in the Morning Post? Oh, no. In a ticklish situation, this one with the Brewers. He's been lunching with Durant. He's rather sore about it. Mm hmm? Oh, I hope he won't do anything rash. I have some influence with him, and of course, I'm doing my best to persuade him not to kick over the traces. I hear your son was to marry Durant's daughter. I've been misinformed. I am going to marry her. You? I needn't tell you. I'll do all in my power to bring Durham to a reasonable state of mind. At present he's wavering. Well, I suppose you know if he goes against us, the others will all follow. Yes. The results will be, um, awkward. Hmm. You heard Gray's dead. Um, Would you like to go to Barchester? Barchester? Oh, excuse me, Lord Stonehenge, but this telegram has just reached me. Oh? oh, forgive me for interrupting, Spratt. Not at all. They've just wired me, most unfortunate, but the Bishop of Sheffield died in his sleep last night. Did you know Dodge Thornwood? I met him only once. Mm. A sad loss. Uh, thank you for letting me know, Poole. Thank you. Not at all. Forgive me for interrupting with such sad tidings. It will need a strong man to succeed him. Hmm. Well, Spratt, you haven't answered my question. Your question? Do you want Barchester? Lord Stonehenge, it is very good of you to make the offer. And I need not say how sensible I am to you, to the honor. But if I may put it frankly, I don't think I can be of much service in a dead and alive place like Barchester. I have a passion for work. I can't live without plenty to do. If I'm to leave London, 
I feel it should be for a place that offers ample scope for a man of my energy. A place where there's a vigorous city life, where one might feel oneself at the centre of this busy and modern world of ours. Advance and progress are my watchwords. I see. But it is too bad of me to take up your time like this. You have so little time for private thought and contemplation. I shall be seeing Durrant again this evening and uh, shall do what I can to persuade him to put his business interests behind his political ones. I see. It's good to see you back from Castle Tango, Winnie. How are you? I'm so very happy, Uncle. You're looking positively radiant. Where's Theo? Still dressing, I presume. I heard him singing in his room as I came down. Gray's dead. Has he got Barchester? I haven't heard. But if he has, I am sure he'll be only too eager to tell us when he comes in. Hello, Uncle Thomas. <laughs> Hello, Winnie. Hello, Lionel. Oh, it's good to see you again. Forgive me for not being in to dinner tonight, but I must attend choir practice. Is your father going to? He's been practicing upstairs. I don't think so. He hasn't said anything. Then it is unlikely. Welcome home, Winnie, dear. Thank you, Papa. Good evening, Thomas. I trust your day has not been too dull. You're very cheerful, Theo. Who would not be? The family all gathered together again. How delightful. How's Harry, William? He's wonderful. I'll always be grateful to you, Papa. Your father's a wise man, William. And claims his right to say it. If you'll excuse me, Father, I must be going. You're going, my boy, but this is a family dinner. There's choir practice, Father. Oh, so there is. So there is. I've had a full and busy day, and it slipped my mind. Excuse me, sir. This telegram has just come for you. Oh, thank you, Ponsonby. And dinner is served, my lady. We'll be down directly. Oh. Uh, what is it, Papa? Uh, get me a glass of sherry, Ponsonby. Yes. What is it, Father? Stupid of me. Theodore, what is wrong? Thank you, Ponsonby. We'll be down presently. Very good, sir. What was in that telegram? Sir, so I um, will be gratified to learn that the government has offered me the vacant bishopric of Sheffield. <laughs> oh, the oh, old. I'm so glad. Well, Sir, Oh. Well. Presumably, you don't want me to persuade you to take it. No. I shall accept it as it was offered. Frankly, and by telegram. I am delighted at the news, but I must go now. They're all waiting. Of course, my boy. I mustn't keep you from your duties. Oh, but I'm forgetting. Lionel, wait. I think the time has come to announce Winnie's betrothal publicly. Oh, Papa. Just a minute. My boy, and write the notice. You can leave it at the news agency as you pass. Certainly, Father. <clears throat> we are authorized to announce that a marriage has been arranged between Lord Roxham of Castle Tanker and Winifred, only daughter of the Honorable and Reverend Canon Theodore Spat, Bishop-elect of Sheffield. That's all. That's enough. Take it, my dear boy, and go. I fear you are made very late for your choir practice. Yes, Father. Well, Thomas, you see that virtue is sometimes rewarded, even in this world. What's the gofflings like? I'm convinced they're excellent. And I shall be pleased to see you in Sheffield. The hospitality of the palace will ever be at the command of the head of my family. There wouldn't be a rebellious parson in your diocese. You'll make it far too hot for anyone who don't act according to your lights. A gentleman wishes to see you, sir. I can see no one at this hour. I can't keep dinner waiting any longer. I told him, sir, but he wouldn't take any notice. He's a gentleman from the press, sir. Ah, well, that certainly makes a difference. I put him in the study. I shall join him directly. Very good, sir. Theo, are we to have no dinner? I have a duty to perform. You forget that my position is radically altered. I knew you'd remind us of it in less than five minutes. Well, I and my family have always been in the vanguard of progress. Yes, 
Yes, but even your family wants to eat something. I should have thought that upon such an occasion, worthy of thought would occupy your mind. But if your flesh is weak, I am willing that you should begin without me. I'm not a selfish man, and heaven forbid that I should ask as a right what a Christian disposition should grant as a pleasure. Fiddlesticks! I must beg you not to act towards me any longer with this mixture of indecent frivolity and vulgar cynicism. I don't wish to remind you that there is a change in my position. That's twice in five minutes. It appears to be necessary. I shall go and talk with the gentleman in my study. You may go to dinner. Oh, it may interest you to know that on the 31st of July, I'm going to be married to Gwendolyn Dowd. Well, Papa. He always has the last word. And probably always will. In The Bishop's Apron, you heard George Baker as Canon Theodore Spratt, Peter Pratt as Lord Spratt, and Lydia Sherwood as Lady Sophia Spratt. Winifred Spratt was played by Pat Pleasance, Lionel Spratt, John Rye. Lord Roxham, Geoffrey Beavers. Mrs. Railing, Nora Blaney. Bertram Railing, Michael Spice. Louise Railing, Joe Manning Wilson. Lord Stonehenge, Noel Eilif, Lady Patricia Stonehenge, Ursula Hurst. Sir John Durrant, Martin Friend, Gwendolyn Durrant, Sheila Grant. Mrs Fitzherbert, Betty Bascom, Mrs Cordell, Marjorie Forsyth, Ponsonby, Dennis McCarthy, Bishop Poole, Leslie Heritage. The play was dramatised for radio by Donald Tosh from the novel the Bishop's Apron by W. Somerset Maugham. The production was by Graham Gould.